One of these countries' economies is about to crash within the next couple of years. And a perfect example of this is South Africa. Blackouts and riots, looting and poverty. South Africa is undoubtedly in a very rough place, but the most visible problem within the country is inequality, which is now at its highest levels in decades. Because the richest 10% of the population now own over 85% of household wealth, with 3,500 of the wealthiest South Africans owning more than the poorest 32 million put together. To put into context, this is over half of the country's population. Unemployment is also a massive problem here, with over 60% of the country's young people not even having a job. The divisions between the rich and poor are plain to see, just a few meters separates completely different worlds. And with no hope of a brighter future, millions of young South Africans have turned to violent crime to make their living. An endemic culture of gang warfare and violence has festered across the nation, culminating in an infamous spree of violent crime and rioting, making South Africa infamous for being one of the world's most dangerous countries. And now the strain on essential national services is also reaching critical levels. In fact, flights were recently grounded at Cape Town International Airport after a shortage of jet fuel. And so it's no surprise that the education system is now one of the worst in the world because of the government's negligent underfunding. Recent testing showed that over a quarter of children in school for over six years still couldn't read, leaving the next generation of South Africans sorely underprepared to tackle the problems of the future. And in the face of all of these mounting problems, the government has been grossly incompetent becoming infamous for a history of dodging problems by creating entirely new ones. Like when they banned alcohol during lockdowns, putting thousands of livelihoods in danger for no real reason. And because of these systemic issues, economists are now predicting yet another recession in South Africa this year, on top of their already disastrous economy. And now why is this happening in South Africa? Well, the main reason for this is the all-encompassing web of corruption that has brought South Africa's economy to its knees. In the country, it affects all levels of society. At the top, you can see corruption at the state monopoly power company Exxon, which has led to years of gross incompetence, where vital repairs to infrastructure were postponed or cancelled, all in order to siphon off more funds, leaving South Africa's entire energy grid physically incapable of supplying a hungry, growing country. And that's why in the last couple of years, South Africa has faced bouts of 12-hour long blackouts, and they've just been getting worse. There were four and a half times as many in 2022 compared to 2021. And in this year of 2023, it's expected to get even worse. I mean, South Africa has literally been blinded by corruption and there's really no rush at the top to fix things. Instead, those at the top are focused on petty power struggles and schemes, with one of the previous chief executives of Exxon being poisoned with cyanide, presumably by his rivals in the company, as he was fired just months later after denying corruption charges. However, there is some light of hope in South Africa. People are fighting back, like Babita Dio Karen. Over the course of 30 years, she has built a career as a public servant, fighting South Africa's corruption. She was pivotal in uncovering a corrupt scheme that stole 500 million South African rand from hospitals, equivalent to nearly $30 million. And Babita's reward for this work came a year later, when she was gunned down in broad daylight on the 23rd of August, 2021, after dropping off her daughter at school. And despite her status as a whistleblower, the government had offered her no protection. And after investigations concluded, the person who hired the hit has escaped justice. However, 6,500 miles away in North Africa, things aren't looking too good either. Anyone can find anything on the internet, including your full legal name, your personal email, your home address, phone number, and even your relatives. This information is accessible because of data brokers, who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers, and anyone else that wants to learn more about you. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. And you can use my link aura.com forward slash moon to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your information. Also link to my description or scan the QR code. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they're involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web, giving you recommendations on what to do. Aura's app also features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit, and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and protects your device from malware. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need, all inside of one app. So let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. And if you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link. And you'll be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over those two weeks. So go to aura.com forward slash moon to start your free trial. Also link to the description or scan the QR code. Rising costs and stagnating wages have created a death spiral of poverty, and no country better illustrates this than the savage cycle that Tunisia is facing, where their economic outlook is particularly dire. 
you see the country's public debt was already at 70% of the nation's GDP, a staggering amount that's now risen to nearly 90% since then, a number that has massively increased in just a matter of years. So it's no surprise that poverty rates have also jumped above 15%, just 10 years after the Tunisian revolution. A revolution that was partially incited by worsening economic conditions in the company just a decade ago. But now Tunisians are back to seeing severe shortages of fuel, flour, bread, sugar and other essential supplies. And that's on top of the regular droughts they face in the country. And so that begs the question, what kind of government can Tunisian people turn to in its time of need, when unfortunately the democratic ideals of the revolution that happened in 2011 have already quickly been cast aside, as last year Tunisia's 10-year experiment with democracy was cut short by a dictatorial coup. Kaye Syed is the new man in power, after seizing it in a bloodless coup just a few years after he won the presidency. And he hasn't been shy about cracking down on political opponents with mass arrests, he's even arresting people critical of the regime on social media, and the political instability hasn't made things any better. Mass protests and strikes have ground the economy to a halt, and Syed's solution for this country's woes is a hard and long austerity program, designed to cut the basic support that Tunisia still gives to its people. Subsidies on clean drinking water have been slashed for example, leading to a $23 increase in water prices nationwide, and overall spending on subsidies will be slashed by 26.4%, while taxes will rise by 12.5%. These plan reforms convinced the IMF to go forward with an emergency loan of $1.8 billion. But the recent instability has led to delays, as well as cutting all of Tunisia's tourism money. And that's why not many creditors even want to invest in a country on the brink of economic collapse, causing Tunisia's credit rating to recently be downgraded again, signaling a high risk that any loans to Tunisia will be defaulted on. And whether Tunisia's new autocratic government will survive the coming crisis is a complete mystery. The only thing that is clear is that Tunisia is dangerously close to bankruptcy. But there's still countries that are further along the road to disaster than Tunisia. In fact, Lebanon has gone from crisis to crisis for years, causing 80% of the population to land in poverty. Things have gotten so bad that clean water shortages have become the norm, giving rise to one of the worst cholera outbreaks in decades. In fact, this current crisis is the worst they've ever seen, which is why Lebanon's currency has completely collapsed. In fact, the government recently devalued it by 90% and it still hasn't caught up to the real scale of inflation. So in response, the banks have been blocking people from withdrawing their savings without taking a massive portion of it. And the only way that anyone's gotten their money back is by taking it back from the bank at gunpoint. Although in this case, it's really the reverse of theft. So then why has inflation gotten so bad in Lebanon? It's almost like the economy was pushed towards collapse. Well, there's several reasons. The first reason that elites in Lebanon point to is external factors like the war in neighboring countries like Syria, in addition to the COVID pandemic as the causes behind their economic chaos. But like all good lies, this is only half of the picture, as the World Bank has called Lebanon's inflation crisis a deliberate depression by the financial elite, likening what they did to a Ponzi scheme. Because you see, before the war in Syria and the pandemic, the Lebanese government spent years making hollow promises to investors in exchange for massive loans. They created an illusion of a healthy currency by constantly propping up its value with further loans. In a classic Ponzi scheme cycle, they would use new loans to pay off old ones. And like all Ponzi schemes, it eventually came to an explosive end when Lebanon could no longer justify more loans. The war and the pandemic made investors so much more cautious in the country, which eventually sent the economy into a death spiral. Just before the beginning of the crisis in 2019, Lebanon's debt had reached 171% of its GDP. And then it all collapsed, the scam fell apart and Lebanon's people were left to pick up the pieces. And the tragedy of the 2020 Beirut explosion came as a deadly reminder of the cost of corruption. All in order to save money, port officials had overlooked the dangerous dumping of volatile explosives in an old warehouse, leading to 218 people losing their lives in the explosion, and over 7,000 more were injured. But if you thought Lebanon had reached rock bottom, you're wrong. Because without a concrete plan in place, the crisis is only going to keep on going. Now Lebanon is trying to get a multi-billion dollar bailout package from the IMF, but it hasn't gone through yet, and so investors are understandably nervous about investing in a government that has been scamming its people for decades. And so without massive reforms and this bailout, Lebanon's future is looking very grim. Whilst Argentina may not be as far gone as Lebanon or Tunisia right now, their future collapse could be far more catastrophic. You see, their debt problem has been festering away for years, and now it's starting to have very serious effects on their economy which is why inflation has reached a high of 95% annually last year, which meant the Argentinian people lost half of their savings in the space of one year. Now obviously the people have been suffering, homelessness has risen massively as more people fall through the widening cracks in the system. It's also why nearly 40% of Argentinians now live below the poverty line, and the worst drought in 60 years has cost the country $20 billion. So to put it simply, things suck right now, 
But the real problem lies in Argentina's massive debt and how they're going to repay it. Because they borrowed $57 billion in 2018 through an IMF bailout, and they've been struggling to pay it back ever since. And this comes after restructuring last year which helped delay the problem. And whether they can keep up with repayments though is a whole other matter. As economic growth is also predicted to slow in Argentina, going from nearly 5% to just 2%, with some outlets predicting a further drop to just 1% growth. Unemployment, which was falling in recent years, has just started picking up again as well. And these predicted gains are nearly enough to keep the Argentinian economy afloat in the face of a total of $174 billion in debt. I mean, there's already discussions now on whether they've already technically defaulted on it. The government has been buying back debt at a crazy rate, sparking fears that it's all getting too much for the government. And it shows in the hyperinflation, which has gotten to the point that it's cheaper to use a 10 peso bill rather than buying actual wallpaper. You see, this is where the real problem lies with Argentina's economy. Both foreign investors and the people have very little confidence in the government's ability to navigate in the country out of the storm. This means that foreign investors are increasingly unlikely to offer the country much needed aid. But on a domestic level, it's played havoc on the country's politics. Years of economic degradation have left the country incredibly polarized, turning every political issue into societal schism. And with this polarization comes mass protests that we're likely to see a repeat of the demonstrations that brought the country to a standstill over 2020 and 2021. For a country that should be able to fall back on a wealth of natural resources, Argentina is incredibly close to bankruptcy. However, if you take bankruptcy as literally running out of cash, Nigeria has everyone beaten. Along with a slew of long-term economic problems, Nigeria has created another crisis out of thin air by running out of paper notes. 55% of Nigeria's population doesn't have access to banking, meaning that they've been left without money in the midst of an economic crisis. Markets that were busy just days ago were virtually abandoned. Nobody can pay for anything. People are waiting in line for hours at the bank or ATM just to get enough money to last the day. So how did this even happen? Well, it started in October when Nigeria's government made the bold decision to replace all of the highest denomination notes in their currency. Worse still, the government gave people just three months before the old notes became worthless. There was an immediate rush to get the new notes, but the government hadn't made nearly enough of them. The move came as part of a misguided grander plan to make Nigeria a cashless society. However, clearly cash is still needed as shown by the months of chaos. And to their credit, when the cash ran out, lots turned to a different kind of cashless transaction, bartering. They were later forced to move the deadline further and further up as the crisis continued. And as a result of this crisis, private sector growth stopped for the first time in three years. But why is the government so desperate to fix what isn't broken? Well, it's part of yet another hollow policy to make it look like Nigeria's government is addressing the endemic corruption problem. Without cash, certain types of money laundering and lower level corruption tactics would get much harder. But it doesn't do anything to stop the most harmful institutional corruption that goes on at the highest levels of government. One example is the ex-accountant general of federation Ahmed Idris, who was arrested on corruption charges in May of 2022. He was accused of masterminding a fraud campaign which drained the equivalent of $236 million from public funds. And it's pretty unlikely that this bit of corruption was conducted using cash. In total, an estimated 170 million bribes are paid in Nigeria every year, as corruption affects every level of society, and it's playing havoc on an already shaky economy. Poverty rates in Nigeria keep on rising, with recent estimates putting the total amount of 133 million Nigerians living in poverty. Shortages are also common, especially concerning fuel, and in a country which produces massive quantities of oil, this shouldn't be happening. But politicians like Ahmed Idris have created a system of fraud where they can sell the oil cheaply to Western companies, all whilst taking a cut for themselves. And this comes at the expense of the people. And with major reforms, the newly elected government does hope to pull the country back from the edge. But this all too familiar debt problem means the way out will be long and hard, as climbing debt repayments could quickly outpace the economy's ability to handle them. And judging by the recent dips in the Nigerian bond market, financial analysis doubt that they have what it takes. But at least there is a way out for Nigeria. Whereas Pakistan's future looks far more bleak. The economy is in the ICU, the politicians are at war, and the people are crying for help. It's one hell of a mess. Fuel shortages are the first of many problems, with rising costs putting an end to lots of businesses' ability to just function, which as a result meant that jobs have been lost at an alarming rate. In October 2022, it was announced that over 1,600 textile mills had been closed all because of fuel shortages, which resulted in 5 million people losing their jobs. And as unemployment skyrockets and wages stagnate, inflation has soared to 40%, the highest it's ever been since the 70s in Pakistan. And this combination of inflation and unemployment has left millions without basic necessities like food, shelter, and basic medical care. 
And as if this wasn't enough, huge floods have ravaged the country in recent months, with one third of the country becoming submerged in water, killing or injuring 15,000 people and displacing a further 8 million. And so as always, the overall crisis is framed by a massive amount of debt which is strangling the economy. In fact, over the last 25 years, Pakistan's national debt has doubled every 5 years. This 14% annual growth in debt completely outweighs the average 3% annual GDP growth. And so it was only a matter of time before Pakistan's economy was just unable to keep up. And so now the government is dangerously low on cash. There's just $3 billion left for a country that has a population of over 230 million people. And so to keep some semblance of order, Pakistan's government has been waiting on a $1.1 billion bailout, which is just one part of a larger rescue plan. However, the IMF has been holding it back, demanding harsher measures like tax increases and fuel price hikes to stave off the collapse. And this financial limbo has been poisonous for Pakistan's recovery, as the value of Pakistan's rupee dropped by 9.6 the day that the IMF's measures were put in place. And that's why the government is on its last legs trying to deal with this fallout, but the crisis has also led to major political upheaval. Former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been leading protests against the current regime, calling for fundamental rights for Pakistan's people. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan is leading a march of his supporters from the eastern city of Lahore to the capital Islamabad, demanding early elections. And he was the president just a year ago. And that's why this represents an existential threat for the current government. And so as a result, the government has issued an arrest warrant for the former prime minister and has cracked down on protesters with tear gas and hoses. And it's not hard to see why so many people blame the government for the crisis. Years of corruption and reckless borrowing have pushed the country over the edge. Mass poverty, an angry populace, and a government in turmoil are a recipe for disaster, making a complete collapse more likely every single day. And the implications for this would be massive. Pakistan's 230 million people are in desperate need, and a further collapse would create a humanitarian crisis of unimaginable proportions. And we shouldn't forget that Pakistan is also a nuclear state, meaning that its fights with the keys to power are closely watched. As right now, Pakistan faces the perfect conditions for a coup, and a new regime could upset the delicate balance of power between Pakistan, India, and China. And so with their crisis deepening every day, it's no surprise that Pakistan is the closest to bankruptcy of all the countries that we've spoken about.